War is terrible. It is. I've seen stuff that a kid shouldn't see. It is. It was bad. December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. I, w I was sitting out in the kitchen one day and I was listening to the radio, then they broke in, started talking about what happened to Pearl Harbor, and after that I started thinking, I thought, I'd like to join the Navy. When I enlisted, I was 16 years old. I even quit school to join it. Only two days short of his 17th birthday, Don Kunkel enlisted with the United States Navy and was sent to Great Lakes for basic training. But because the minimum age requirement was 17, Don spent his first two days waiting. I didn't do nothing. They wouldn't let me do nothing. And then the next day, I turned 17, and then I went out in the field and started my Navy career. Everything was new to me. And everything was hard. But I made it. I, I was scared to death, but I made it. In early 1945, Don was sent to the South Pacific aboard the attack transport USS Dickens to begin preparations for the invasion of Iwo Jima. Don's role would be transporting Marines and supplies to the beach aboard a small landing craft the men referred to as a duck. The night before the invasion, as the Navy fleet shelled the beach in hopes of softening the Japanese defenses, Don lay awake in his bunk, fearful of what the following day might bring. Big 16-inch guns roaring at night, all night long out at Iwo Jima before they hit the beach. I was scared. I was scared to death. In fact, I had tears in my eyes, but I had a, I had a guardian angel come to me and tell me, this is the God's truth told me that I was going to be all right, that they had plans for me. She appeared in front of me and told me not to worry, that I would be okay. But she said, don't take any chances. We pulled up there and they lowered a cargo net in our boat, said we had to take that into the beach. It was big boxes of hand grenades. And I thought, oh Lord, if we ever get hit, they won't find nothing of us. As Don made his first of many trips to the shore of Iwo Jima, he was quickly made aware that the Navy bombardment had done little to deter the Japanese opposition. And they, they was firing at us. They, they could see water flying all over around us. Those three days out in there was, was terrible. I see, I seen, I seen stuff that a kid shouldn't see. It was, it was bad. We was out there waiting to get in the beach, and this duck was out there coming in from a ship, taking some more troops in, and it got a direct hit right in the center of it, and you could just see everything flying. We pulled up alongside and they told me to jump in the in that duck, see if I can get some dog tags or something. Man, I jumped in there and oh my God, terrible. Uh, there wasn't the one there wasn't one whole person in that boat. They was just tore apart. I just jumped back in my boat and they said, "Well, you get any dog tags?" I said, "If you want dog tags, you go ahead and get them." I saw that, oh, a couple months every night when I went to sleep after that. War, war is terrible. 
It is. I seen more Marines laying up on the beach. They were just that beach was covered with dead soldiers. The Marines was covered with them. And just we was right next to an LST at Okinawa, and a Japanese suicide plane hit it and got sunk. I seen things that 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 really hurt me a lot. I seen something falling over a cliff. The Japanese soldiers was telling these women that the Americans would get their kids and torture them. And here the, the women were throwing their kids over this cliff into the water. The Americans, they saw what was going on and they started, on, they got on a loudspeaker and told them not to do that because they'd be taken care of, they'd be given clothes and food but they they wouldn't they listen to the Japanese soldiers and they'd throw their kids over that cliff. Don was more than ready for a change of scenery, and the USS Dickens was sent to the Philippines. Although most of the Philippine islands had been liberated, small groups of Japanese forces continued to hide in the hills, evading capture. The Japanese were coming down out of the hills at night, so we had to take women and children from one island, put them on the ship, and take them to another island where there wasn't no Japanese there. And this one woman was on there, she was pregnant. And I was helping her. I was gonna take her down to sick bay, and as soon as we got her on the ship, she laid right down on the deck. The baby started coming out. And I was the only one right there beside her. And the deck of the ship, it was, it was hot. It was about 112 there. And that steel deck was so hot, I knew if the baby had hit that deck, it would kill it. So me, I, here I am, 17 years old, or eight, just going on 18, and I, that baby's coming out. I thought, oh, God. I kept hollering for a medic to get up. But anyhow, the baby come out. And I was holding the baby. This other guy come up, and he says, well, you're going to have to tie the cord off and cut it. And I, I had my knife with me, and I took my knife, and I, after he tied it off, I cut the cord. And a few days later, they called me over the PA system to report to the sick bay. She wanted to thank me for helping her with the baby, and she let me hold the little baby. I was a little, little boy, nice little boy. <laughs> She's a cute little baby, but I didn't want to go through that again. Everybody from the ship, they call me Dr. Don. <laughs> I says, yeah. I said, Dr. Don's out of business. I says, that's for sure. <laughs> Don's time in the Philippines was relatively quiet. Occurrences of enemy activity were few and far between. Each day was almost as normal as it would have been back home. One Sunday, I didn't have nothing to do. So I thought, well, I've seen a church up there. I think I'm going to go to that church. There was man, a woman, and a girl sitting in front of me. Her name was Lestrina. They wanted to know if I would come up for dinner. I went up for dinner and we talked and I was telling them about my life back in Ohio and they were such a nice family. It was a wonderful family. One night I went up to the house and he told me, he says, he says, if you consider staying in the Philippines here, he says, you marry Lestrina and you'll never have to work in your life. She was such a she was such a nice girl. She was really a good Christian girl, she was. Just as pretty as could be. This one Saturday night, I went up there to see her and uh, she gave me a ring. She gave me this ring and she wanted me to come up Sunday for dinner and I told her I would. The next day I come up and there was bunch of people there and her dad come to the door took me by the hand I knew something was wrong he took me in the front or the dining room she, they had a big dining room table there and they had her laid out on the table in a gown long gown and I said well, what happened and he said the Japanese come down out of the hills that night raped her then they stuck a bayonet in her here and killed her right here. He unbuttoned it and showed me. I had a gash about that long right there. That was it. 
Don remained in the Philippines to begin preparations for the imminent invasion of Japan. But before that day would come, Japan surrendered, and the war finally came to an end. Don returned to civilian life and eventually raised a family, a family that continued to expand when in 1992, he married Louise. Both Don and Louise had been through past heartache, but in each other, they found a strong bond and a lasting happiness. But only a few years into their marriage, Louise fell ill, in permanent need of being cared for, and Don never left her side. He counted it as his privilege, his life's purpose, to care for her. More than 50 years later, Don remembered the words he heard spoken the night before the invasion of Iwo Jima. Getting back to this guardian angel, when she told me that they had plans for me, the plans for me was to take care of my wife when she had the stroke, and I did. I took care of her. She was a wonderful lady, and I took good care of her. So I, I always remember my guardian angel telling me that uh, they had plans for me, and that was it. Yet, I never forget her. Hey everyone, I'm Josh from Memoirs of World War II, and I just want to say thank you for watching this episode, and also give you an opportunity to join up with what we're doing. We're dedicated to reaching as many veterans of the Second World War as we can, both here in the U.S. and across the world, but we're running out of time. The youngest World War II veterans are in their 90s, and every day we're losing more and more of them. So here are three simple ways that you can join with us. First, consider supporting us through Patreon. Patreon is a subscription-based service that keeps projects like this one going. Second, you can share these videos with your family and friends. It's a great way to honor these veterans and get these stories out there. And finally, consider subscribing to our YouTube channel and click the notification bell so you don't miss a single episode. Thanks again for your support and thank you for watching.